Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to address this conference. This conference is being held at a crucial time in order to explore the causes of colossal collapse of the Republic of Afghanistan, its repercussions and the challenges ahead, not only for the Afghan people, but for the international community as a whole, both of whom slowly recovering from a shock, the events of the last one month and a half brought upon us. At this juncture, it is very crucial for the intellectuals of Afghanistan to form correct opinions and courses of action in the best interests of Afghanistan and for the international community not to repeat the same mistakes they committed that helped and enabled Taliban to turn back the clock of history. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, in 12 days from August 2nd to August 14, all 34 provincial centers of Afghanistan, but two, Kabul and Panjshir, had fallen to the Taliban. On August 14, the Taliban reached out streaks of Kabul. In an interview on the 16th of August, Amrullah Saleh, the first vice president said that on August 14, after consultation with Bismillah Mohammadi, the acting defense minister, and other authorities, he realized that there were no more spare forces in Kabul to be sent to the front to defend Kabul. At that crucial point, Kabul was just an island among a sea of Taliban soldiers and forces. Therefore, at this point, it seems that President Ghani had no option but to choose from the following three bad choices. Stay put and continue to fight, which would have resulted in the destruction of the city and perhaps the possible elimination by the Taliban. Second, resign and surrender the city to the Taliban, which would have provided Taliban the crucial legitimacy. And the third choice, do not resign, leave the country, prevent the destruction of Kabul and the loss of thousands of lives, and in the process, deny Taliban military took over from any illusion of legitimacy. He chose the third option. August 15, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, the former Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, said that former President Hamid Karzai had called him twice early that morning, saying that President Ghani had already left Kabul and urging him to invite the Taliban fighters to enter the city. So did oblige the Taliban fighters and occupy the city and the presidential palace the same day. Ladies and gentlemen, the million dollar question on everybody's lips is that what went wrong in Afghanistan? For five years, from 2001 to 2006, after the fall of the Taliban first term government, everything seemed to be going right for the newly formed Republic, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. The medieval regime of the Taliban was defeated. A new democratic constitution was enacted. Modern government institutions were being built. People and businesses were flourishing and the international community 
was providing the necessary means for the Afghan people to build a new Afghanistan, to bring about Afghanistan par with the rest of the world. In such an environment, how it was possible for a medieval force, an ragtag army like the Taliban to be able to resurrect and turn back the clock. On 15th of September, a month after takeover by the Taliban, I published an article on social media entitled Major Factors in the Fall of the Afghan Government to the Taliban. In that article, I focused on five key factors that, to my mind, explain the Taliban's resurgence and victory in Afghanistan. The five factors that brought about the fall of the Republic and complemented each other were identified as First, the mistakes of the Americans in forming and directing the Afghan National Army. A and A. Second, the existence of widespread corruption in Afghanistan and in the A and A helped created by the United States. Third, changes in America's global and regional political and strategic priorities. Fourth, the weaknesses of the Afghan government and the role of the United States and the rest of the international community in it. And finally, fifth, the far-reaching role Pakistan played in the Taliban's political, diplomatic, financial, and military resurrection and ultimately victory in Afghanistan. Here, I have no intention to discuss the above points in detail. However, a brief summary will suffice. We have all seen images that show the heavy burden of neglect, failure, and mismanagement by the U.S. and Afghan governments alike. And in particular, the recent two U.S. administrations, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. The above scenarios that have taken place are complementary of each other. While the relative weight and relative impact of each of them on the failure of the Afghan government cannot be stated correctly with complete certainty. But we all know that they have all made a decisive contribution to what has happened. But how an army which has been fighting more than 95% of military operations since 2014 suddenly melted away like a piece of sugar. The government falls and the Taliban were able to regain power with little resistance. The fact is that when the United States invaded Afghanistan in 2001 and defeated the Taliban with the help of the established jihadist organizations, it did not pay much attention to establishing a national army capable of defeating the Taliban and a national police force in Afghanistan. President Bush and Secretary Donald Rumsfeld made major mistakes. They rejected the offer by many Taliban leaders to negotiate a political solution. What were the purpose of the Americans in Afghanistan? One would ask. Americans never believe in long-term planning. Their policies fluctuate according to the interests of the day. They have neither a permanent friend nor a permanent enemy. For example, as long as China was a developing country, they had no problem with it. And in the last 40 and so years, the United States earned thousands of billions of dollars through trade and economic interactions with China. But today, as China 
appears to be jeopardizing America's global hegemony in all areas. It has become America's number one enemy. Similarly, a broken Russia under Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s was a good friend of America. However, today a powerful Russia, led by Vladimir Putin, is considered an enemy of the United States. Hence, by the time Donald Trump became President of the United States, the United States global and regional strategic interests were changing. These strategic changes in the U.S. foreign policy have changed all United States foreign policy equations, including the goals of the United States presence in Afghanistan. Confirmation of this view can be found in the words of Colonel Lawrence B. Wilkerson, who was Chief of Staff of Colin Powell, Secretary of State during George W. Bush era. In 2018, he described the reason for the U.S. being in Afghanistan lately as, first, it is not nation building, he says, but confronting Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups in order to prevent a recurrence of the events of September 11. Second, he, he mentions, the possible use of Afghanistan by the CIA to support the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, ETIM, operations to, to destabilize China's Xinjiang province, where the Uyghur Muslims are fighting the Chinese government and so disrupt China's Belt and Road projects. And third, being in a striking distance from Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. Hence, these tragic changes in the US foreign policy suddenly elevated Taliban from a terrorist organization, an enemy to a strategic asset status. Accordingly, the United States started in the so-called peace negotiations in Doha, Qatar. Ignoring the government of Afghanistan in the process while enhancing the Taliban political status at the international level. On 29 February 2020, the United States signed a peace deal with the Taliban in Doha, promising the Taliban a, I quote, a new Islamic government. With, with preservation of no human rights and women rights conditions attached to, and with the provision of releasing Taliban's 5,000 prisoners soon after. This agreement had two undisclosed attachments, which I believe include the commitments by the Taliban to allow CIA operations in Afghanistan to assist the ETIM using Afghanistan soil under the Taliban in the future. The Taliban, with strong religious affiliations with the objectives of the ETIM, had no problem providing such assurances. However, they did not take into account the necessities of Pakistan-China relations in this equation. The signing of the Doha Agreement and the subsequent U.S. pressure on the Afghan government of President Ghani to fulfill the U.S. promises to the Taliban sealed the fate of the Afghan government by its delegitimizing and demoralizing effects. By giving the Taliban a full year to regroup, re-equip for a final push without being targeted by the U.S. and Allies Air Forces and crucially by the withdrawal of some 15,000 foreign technicians and contractors who were responsible for repairing and pre preparing the Afghan National Army Air Force and military equipment. Hence, the Afghan Army lost its operational capability and its fighting morale. Systematic weakening of the Republic government was another a crucial factor in eventual collapse of the Afghan state. 
after 2001 and the formation of the government of Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, the United States and United Nations formed the core of the Afghan government with members of the Northern Alliance, minority ethnic groups, while giving the presidency to a little known Hamid Karzai, a member of the by far largest Pashtunk ethnic group in the country. Over the years, Karzai became subservient of the Northern Alliance influential groups in his own government. With the defeat of the candidates of the Northern Alliance minority ethnic groups in the subsequent four presidential elections, by the Pashtun candidates, Hamid Karzai first and uh, thereafter Ashraf Ghani, the anti-Pashtun and Afghan nationalism sentiment among the group forming the Northern Alliance, namely the Jamiyat, who is a Tajik-dominated uh, party, Wahdat, Hazara-dominated, and Junbish, Uzbek-dominated, and their supporters grew and widespread. This was facilitated by the Iranian cultural incursions in Afghanistan through media outlets such as Tulu Television, Monopoly of Print, Radio, Television, and the Internet. Their loyalty to Afghanistan was extended to only to the point that the state facilitated their sectarian agenda. They did not believe in the concept of the nation in Afghanistan and never accepted the notion of being Afghan. For them, no national interests exist in Afghanistan, but the interests of the uh, ethnic groups individually. These jihadi groups, together with their jihadi, other jihadi groups in the East and South, who helped the U.S. defeat and unseat the Taliban in the, the 2001, enjoyed privileged positions in the government and monopolized the economy to the point that a mafia was emerged within the government, who resented many central government decisions. Leaders of these groups became multimillionaires through unfair practices, theft of public monies, confiscation of public lands, and other resources such as import, import duties, misuse of government contracts, and foreign aid. Abdullah Abdullah emerged as the central anti-Pashtun figure who refused to accept his defeat in three subsequent elections and resorting in forming a parallel government after his defeat at the last elections. Meanwhile, the United States, instead of supporting the democratic processes, sided with Abdullah and forced Karzai first and lately Ghani to compromise and finally to accept 50-50 shared government arrangements which demoralized the government and undermined its authority where loyalty of the high-ranking government figures and army officers were divided between the president and Abdullah. This played important role in the subsequent fall of the government. While the Tajik Jamiat Hazara Wahdat and the Uzbek Jumbish groups from time to time were displaying armed resistance by their militia to the central government's authority. However, the, at the moment of the truth, when Taliban fighters showed at their doors, they were nowhere to be seen. The majority, non Pashtun northern and western provinces of Faria, Badris, and Herat, were among the first to fall to the Taliban. Despite the indifferences of the Americans and the Europeans in assessing the true dimensions and importance of Pakistan's role in the eventual overthrow of the Afghan government by the Taliban, the Pakistani factor is a, is a prominent key factor. Many Afghans and analysts around the world believe that the Pakistani military has trained the Taliban, equipped them with logistics, with logistical services, and even provided officers 
advisors and soldiers to help the Taliban in their campaign. In other words, the ANA actually facing a force that is largely trained by a much larger and more professional army. But why does Pakistan support the Taliban? Mainly to control Afghanistan, to build strategic depth against India, and to prevent Indian influence in Afghanistan. In addition, there is the issue of the Tapi gas pipeline, which could one day supply Pakistan with gas from Turkmenistan. And the issue of the Pakistan's access to Central Asia, to Afghanistan. An obedient government in Kabul, in these cases, is considered a vital necessity for Pakistan by its leaders. Despite numerous threats to Pakistan's internal cohesion and stability from the Taliban and their Al-Qaeda affiliates, Pakistan continue to support extremist Islamists. It fully believes that, if necessary, it will be able to control them in the future. If the situation in Afghanistan is in its favor, it was possible that Pakistan would try to have the upper hand in shaping Afghanistan's future political system under the Taliban. The incident after August 15 this year showed that Pakistan used its tremendous influence over the Taliban to install a completely submissive government. But it did not take long for disputes between factions, including, with, including included within the Taliban over the composition of the new government of the Islamic Emirates, to create a new government after the Taliban occupied Kabul while Mullah brother and prominent members of the Taliban negotiating team in Doha were expected to occupy key government positions. They strongly were opposed by the Haqqani group, which has the close support of the ISI or Pakistan Military Intelligence Organization. These groups commands military operations in Afghanistan. Faced with the intervention of the ISI chief, who traveled to Kabul to intervene, the Doha Taliban team were ousted and forced to second and third degree posts and were replaced by the extremist groups within the Taliban leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, consequences of Taliban takeover. Experiences, the 1996 to 2001 government of the Taliban, people of Afghanistan have first-hand experience of how a Taliban government rule will look like. This is not necessarily the case in Pakistan. While the whole Pakistani establishment supported the Taliban, however, a recent public opinion poll suggests that 55% of Pakistanis were happy in Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. Nevertheless, a young girl echoed the true sentiment and her video clip gone viral in social media. While declaring that she loved the Taliban, confronted with the question if she would like to live under the Taliban rule, she was shouting no. No, no. Another example of the harsh Taliban rule does not exist in the entire world. A Saudi Arabia of 1960s may have come close. A more moderate face of the Taliban who signed the Doha Agreement with the United States may have been sidelined by the strict Haqqani group with the help of the Pakistani chief intelligence chief, as a result, basic rights of the Afghan people are denied to them by the new rulers. While boys' school opened in Afghanistan, girls' schools are still closed, and female employees are at large still staying at home throughout Afghanistan. 
Music and sporting activities are still prohibited. All cultural and entertainment shows on televisions are banned and cancelled in the country. While it is true that corrupt practices are stopped and people do not fear of petty crimes such as theft, however, one would argue that in any prison, such disciplinary measures will work and would be effective. Given the above, if the rule model of the governing of governing Afghanistan or the 7th century AD practices in Arabia, then the future of Afghanistan seems to be bleak indeed. Worrying reports suggest that since takeover by the Taliban, thousands of members of terrorist groups such as Jaish Muhammadi, Lashkari Taiba, Lashkari Jangvi, Al Qaeda, and others moved from Pakistan into Afghanistan. Reports also suggest that thousand members of the Uzbekistan Islamic Movement, as well as the East Turkestan Islamic Movement (ETIM), were involved in the Taliban offensive operations in North Afghanistan. This is why Russia, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan are busy making defensive preparations close to Afghan border. The challenges ahead. After taking over Kabul and most of Afghanistan, Taliban were faced with an armed opposition from the Panjshir Valley. Most active members of the former, former Tajik Shurai Nizar Alliance, including the former Vice President Amrullah Saleh, former Justice Minister Fazil Ahmad Malawi, former Defense Minister Bismillah Mohammadi, Afghan Doha negotiating team member Hafiz Mansour, and some other former Jihadi commanders, moved with a large amount of Afghan National Army weapons and cash into Pashir Valley. They formed a resistance movement under the leadership of Ahmad Mahsoud, the young son of, slain, of the slain Jihadi commander Ahmad Shah Mahsoud, who enjoyed support from the French government, Iran, Russia, and India in the past against the Taliban first government in Afghanistan. This group tried to negotiate with the Taliban and sent a delegation to a delegation of religious scholars to Charikar city, halfway between Kabul and Panjshir. However, after a week of negotiations, an agreement could not be reached due to the sectarian nature of the demands by the Panjshir resistance, who were seeking a privileged treatment of the Panjshir province and the, and the resistant leaders by the Taliban. In a quick battle that followed, the Taliban fighters were able to subdue the resistance. Soon after, the resistance leaders fled the country. This resistance, I must emphasize, this resistance did not enjoy the popular support of the majority of the Afghan people. Due to its limited sectarian demands and demands of retaining the privileged status the leaders of the resistance enjoyed during the last 20 years against the will of the majority of the Afghan people. So at this juncture, for the Afghan intellectuals and the international community, what are the correct op opinions and correct courses of action that serve the best interests of Afghanistan and the world in general? Recent calls for an inclusive government echoed by many quarters. If an inclusive government, however, means including the dep deposed mafia members in the Taliban government and restoring the mafia elite, including the Panjshir mafia privileges, such demands defeat the purpose. The true requirements, demands, and rights of the Afghan people can be summarized as the following. Keeping the peace of the 40 years of continuous war and destruction. 
keeping the territorial integrity of Afghanistan, forming a legitimate government with a mandate from a traditional law jirga of Afghan people or through a fair and free general elections supervised by the United Nations having a government who understands and cares about the needs of the country in the 21st century, responsive and capable to providing such needs. A government that is not welcoming terrorist organizations and, prevent, and prevents the country to becoming a safe haven for the international terrorist groups. A government in peace with itself and its neighbors, and with the world, a government recognized and respected in the world, keeping the basic human rights that people enjoyed during the last 20 years that included right to education for men and women, right to receive essential health services, right to work outside home without restrictions, right of receiving natural justice, right of free speech and expression of opinion without the fear of reprisal by the state, right of travel, the rights of minority groups in the population, right of being safe from inhuman punishments and treatment by the state, and so more. Are the Taliban capable of fulfilling the above requirements, demands and rights? Unfortunately, all evidence so far points to the contrary. Therefore, my fellow Afghan, the way ahead is not to restart another war or other wars, but to engage in enlightening the masses, the people of Afghanistan, and the people and the governments and the international community as a whole with facts, figures, and right direction. Thank you for your attention.